Okay. Apparently we're live. Could you could you please check at your end by any chance to see? Oh, the the <laughs> <laughs> YouTube and these technical problems, eh? <laughs> yeah, I I I I, uh, I I I apologize. We are 21 minutes behind time, and uh, people have probably just got cheesed off with uh, what's going on over here at Radiation. But um, if we were funded by drug money and all the rest of that, and our car money, we would have all the latest equipment and technology over here. But we don't. Uh, which is which is, uh, which is which is which is fine. We use what we have, and um, it's a real pleasure uh, to have uh, Raj Singh, or should we call him Raj, which is sounds more posher, um, <laughs> from Exclusive PR, the founder, the founding father of his brainchild, Exclusive PR, which is running since 2014. Uh, how are you feeling this morning? I'm feeling uh, great. The sun's out. Um, can't complain. Got a day off, so I thought um, I'd do this interview with you. Thank you for having me on, Dad. Um, it's 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 a it's a great honour, and yeah, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to your your questions and um, let's have some fun and help some people out, out, out there as well with some tips and so people can get to know like what my company is about as well and I like where I've come from. So yeah, over to you. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, what made you? get into PR like, what 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 because I thought I thought to myself I've got to interview the people behind the music industry the people which you don't always see the people which are those making things happen you know uh, those with the sleepless nights and all the aggro and um what, what made you do it um for me it was a personal experience I had um I released a track in 2009 it was uh, with a friend of mine and what happened was um, we actually went to a studio, we produced it, we uh, got the whole track ready, we got it packaged for the press release, and we went with a record label and a PR company to release it. So what happened was um, it didn't really get the exposure that we wanted, you know, and as people know that the Asian music industry is quite competitive as it is. So then what we my friend did was we actually... Um, we actually ourselves did a lot of research. So we went onto the internet and we Googled all the late, all the local radio stations and we went out and then we handed our press release. And back in those days, CDs were a big thing. So we we're handing out a copy of our CD. And then I thought to myself, do you know what? I need to, I do like this actually, because it's like helping someone like get somewhere. So in 2010 is when I kind of like went solo um, under Dream Beats. And I was approached by a PR company to do my marketing. So I started to work with them. And that's where my passion and that's where my desire came because the more clients we had on board, the more I understood that how the marketing industry works and how especially the music industry works. So for me in 2014, I went away for a bit and then I came back um, from holiday and I thought, I want to launch a marketing agency because the aim was to release my next track and then um, 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 help launch artists and the idea was to help upcoming artists, independent artists not established ones because the thing with established artists right they already have a, a, a brand awareness they already got a structure in place they already got like like A&R teams and they already got like a management team so my aim was to actually help up and coming artists to basically give them a platform and help them to actually get out there um and then that actually evolved into the corporate industry, so helping businesses. So that's how I actually got into it. It was through my, my musical journey. I'm going to be touching on on that in in a short while regarding um, the corporate industries as well, how you've been helping them out during lockdown, cause, which has been a difficult time. Many SMEs have had to uh, close their doors. Those which uh, took the initial uh, you know loans, um, they got hit by the... Um, the second lockdown, which then crippled them after taking the uh, the loan as well. So therefore, um, I know it's not the financial or anything, but I'm basically saying that for you to help them uh, with their PR, you know, they would have had to transition from uh, foot traffic to home delivery, on online delivery sort of services, and that's it's a it's a big change. Yeah. Um, so, what makes exclusive PR exclusive? <laughs> well. Um... Firstly, I think like with myself, I'm an artist um, and first and foremost. So my musical journey starts from uh, me being a musician. So uh, I learned to play the dawn 
Um, I got into music pretty late. I, I got into um, the percussion um, uh, part of it in my late, in my early 20s, sorry, so about 21, 22 I was. So I started playing with my local uh, doll group here in East London called the Doll Academy. So I learned the, I learned playing the doll and then my transition automatically happened into music production and then DJing. So for me, when I take on an artist, I look at that product as if it's my own So Me as a director of my company, I understand what it takes to release a track. And what we tend to do is we tend to now um, offer loads of different services and the way we market the clients as well. I don't think any other UK marketing agency will probably go down that route. So we come up with very creative and innovative ways of actually marketing. And I think, especially like now, um, that we're in lockdown and that we've had to work from home, a lot of musicians have suffered. So I think a lot of musicians, from what I saw during the last year, have been coming up with creative, innovative ways of getting themselves out there. You know, and that's something that we will advise our clients. And then you can still have a music career. There's so many different ways now with social media, you know, with live video streaming, like what we're doing today. You know, there are so many different platforms, there's so many different ways. So I've got a great team behind me that actually understands the whole marketing spectrum. So we understand how the music industry works. And the music industry is no different to the corporate because it's always evolving and it's always changing. So if you look at from back in the days from when they had um, uh, the reels to the records, to cassettes, to CDs, and now it's all about online streaming, isn't it? So it's all about Spotify and, and, and Apple and that. A lot of people don't buy music anymore. It's all about online streaming now. So we have creative strategies that we can actually help. But on top of that, um, we have got a lot of contacts in the UK. So we, so I'm, I'm talking from south down to the Midlands to the north. And then we've got a global contact base as well, like a huge mailing list like where we can actually market artists to. Um, and the other thing is that we have a lot of promoters on our mailing list. So if somebody wants to do a show, then we can actually speak to the promoters and say, look, like we've got this artist, what do you think? And some of these promoters are very good for family friends. Some of them are family members and some of them are friends that I've known for a very long time. So that's what makes us a little bit different from a lot of PR companies. I know that some of them actually just put out um, like a, they just send out like a mail blast and that's it. But yeah, we do a, yeah. more than that. We do chase up through scheduled interviews. You know, we make sure that an artist has a representation from our company. So it makes the artist exclusive, so to speak. Uh, so it yeah. makes them feel like a superstar when they're going into like an interview. Because I think with an artist, right, they've got to be, they want to be, they want to be made to feel special. You know, they want to be made to feel like an artist. And I think you can do that by having like a chaperone service that we actually provide. You know, and then we do like, um, which was a big trend back in the, I think it was back in uh, in the mid 2000s, right? Where a lot of artists were doing their video diaries and that just died out, yeah. right? And I think doing behind the scenes video diaries is a big thing uh, going forward now because I think that would ultimately show the public what it takes to actually make a track and what it takes to actually get a track out into the industry. So we have a lot of creative ways of actually helping artists that's in a nutshell, <laughs> so wow. to speak. But, yeah, I think that that that's a that's that's, that's a great answer uh, which, which you gave there. Now, what I wanted to pick up uh, on is regarding many people, including artists, have been hit massively during the lockdown, which has hit their income stream. So, yeah. how has that affected um, exclusive PR, and what have you done to adapt to this lack of income that artists have now got? Or have had and slowly firing back up again. Um, what we tend to do is, um, I had an artist last year who actually approached me. Uh, I think it's right about October, November time, and we did market him. So, what we did do is, obviously, as you can appreciate, being a business, we cannot work for free. So, what we tend to do is, we tend to lower our prices, make it, so to speak, a COVID rate, um, and we make it more affordable for the artist. Um, but at the same time, what we also do is we also offer a lot of free advice. So we give them a lot of guidance, a lot of free advice, what they can do, what they can't do, what they should do. You know, so I think for our business as well, because we don't have like a office, so to speak. So we were OK because we can adapt our businesses mainly online. Yeah. So yeah. if we look at most of our Smart. social media platforms, we do offer a lot of free tips. So if an artist came to me today and said, I haven't got a big budget, we will work within the means of that budget. But that means then there's basically um 
um, leveling up to that expectation. So we have to manage the expectation of the artist, you see. Um, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I've, I've had loads of artists come to me and some of them have got some next to no budget here. And it's unfortunately, I can't work with that because yeah. all you're going to get, right, is just a mass mail out. And for you, you need more than that. And especially if you're a new artist, yeah, yeah. it just yeah. helps if you've got a budget. Now, it's like with any business, right? When you are setting up a project, you have a budget. So you have a budget for, let's say, um, uh, for marketing, you have a budget for products, you have a, a, a budget for staff, you have a budget for premises. It, music's no different. So you will have a, a budget for, let's say, production studio, you have a budget for percussionists, you have a budget for your music video, you have a budget for um, your marketing. So if you've got that structure and if you've got that plan, then I think you can budget your projects really well. And that's the kind of advice that we give to clients as well, especially like during COVID now, it's been quite difficult. So basically, would it be fair to say that the distribution uh, and the, the marketing and distribution is as important as the product itself? I would think so. Hmm. Um, I would think so. But the way I try to explain to artists as well is that if your product's good and if, if it's a really good product, the, the product would sell. Because sometimes the way you can look at it is that the product isn't, it's not great. But if you package it to be the biggest product of the year and, and if the public don't like it, then it's not going to do well. So it's ultimately down to the public. And um, that's just the way the music industry is. It's just set up that way. Um, whereas the corporate industry is different, you see. So if somebody like a product, they'll buy it. But with the music industry, because you're a public figure and if your product isn't great, no one's going to support it. It doesn't matter how much you push it on radio. It doesn't matter how many interviews you do. So that's the, so, so that's the way it comes to it. True, but, true. But going but going back to your question, yeah, I think streaming now has become a very, very important part of um, an artist's income. I think that's just one one part of many other um, avenues of income that they can have. It's it's true. But on the flip side as well, you do have examples where a lot of money has been put into marketing on an absolutely dog poo product, yeah, such as <laughs> such as, as as Crazy Frog, and you know for that to become number one. You know, years ago, you think to yourself, right, musically, it's not the greatest thing in the world. All the kids are jumping up and down. They've, 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 they've hit um, you know, the, the target audience. Um, yeah. How, how do you make that decision where you basically listen to someone's track and you know, how do you deal with an artist? Because as a, as a presenter, I'm very, very um, blatant. I'm saying, I'll just say, change this, change that, maybe. Because I get a lot of music, a lot, a lot of music sent into me. Like I've got emails coming in during this talk right now, um, <laughs> this interview um, with with whole albums uh, dropping. So um, it's just um, how do you deal with someone who approaches you and the the song isn't sounding too hot? Um, what we tend to do is we don't we don't want to because. One thing that we've got to realize about artists, right, is that they've put their blood, sweat, and tears into this. Okay, so we got to basically be a bit careful how we how we manage that because if we are really harsh with them, then they're going to lose that confidence and then they could go away. And, and you know that mental health has been a massive issue as well during lockdowns, right? So what we try to do is we try to manage that as well. So we try to be as constructively critical as we can. And what we tend to do is we do tend to say that, yes, this product is going to be okay for this market, but it's not going to probably work in this market. And what you might need to do is change this because this ain't going to work and this will work in this market. So sometimes we get like urban artists that want to hit the the Asian market just like a blanket. But sometimes, right, the contacts that we have, it might not work for their audience yeah. for that for that particular radio station or for a particular uh, platform. So we have to manage that and we have to then target the right audience and we have to target the right um the right platforms so it's just about being a bit being basically just giving back some constructive criticism but not being overly critical as well we just got to manage that because we don't want someone to basically go off and do something uh, that they shouldn't be doing you know like um because mental health is really really big and we have been um an advocate of that like we are really really big on mental health because we personally have seen during lockdowns how it's affected people and how it's affected business owners and artists and that as well so it's um it's a huge thing. So when that is so taking that in mind, we do we, we we basically take a gentle gentle approach, not so much a a harsh critical approach. 
So that's how we manage that side of it. Okay. Um, okay. So w would you say, would a, would a gentle approach be something such as, um, could you could could you test the market? You know, you know, you know. Do you advise uh, clients as to release timing as well, such as you know, so and so is dropping a track on, you know, the the old way it used to be was like you knew when something was going to land roughly, yeah, and uh, by keeping an ear close to the floor. But nowadays with um with with, with digital um you know uh, digital distribution uh. Uh, you know, and uh, things are just dropping uh, around the clock. So, is that advice still relevant regarding timing or, or so and so, which is a big artist, just, for, just has dropped a big track today? I don't think we should drop it today. We should drop it tomorrow, etc., etc. Is 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 that is that true? Um, I would say so. I would say so because I think what what you got to remember now, if you're a, a, an upcoming artist, what's happening is you're going, you're a small fish in a big pond. And what you've got to do is you've got to be able to leverage your marketing against your product. So if a, an A-list artist is releasing something today, we've got to manage that and think that how long is that marketing going to go on for? So that promotion for that particular track could be two, three weeks, even a month. So we may say to the artist, okay, hold back until the market's a bit quiet. The, that's how we still market our clients. I think sometimes it's best to do it like that. Some artists have different ideas or sometimes those ideas are not necessarily going to work because if you drop it alongside like another big artist, you're just going to disappear amongst all of that marketing that's been focused on that particular artist. So, yes, yeah, so the answer to your question is 100% because if you're a new artist, right, you've put all your effort, my time and money into that one project. And if it doesn't work, you then can't reinvest into your next project. You see, so and the way artists work now is they actually rely on, on live gigs and they rely on streaming income. You know, and to some point, yeah, royalties as well. So that has to be all worked into their marketing plan when you're going forward. And the way we market is we market from release date backwards. So we work out what needs to be done over the over the course of the marketing campaign, what needs to happen, who it goes to, and so forth. So we then carefully, strategically um, market. But if the artist is if the artist is persistent that he wants to release, then we will say, okay, there's like a disclaimer. Then um, we will do our best. But if the track doesn't work and you don't get the level of exposure, you got to remember that you signed this because of this. You see, so we have that kind of like a disclaimer as well that we do advise. But if we go against our advice, then that will be on your head because we're as a marketing professionals, we know what works in the market and what doesn't. Okay, okay. So could you please describe a typical yeah. day? in the life of uh, Raj, exclusive PR, like, like from the moment the alarm clock, if, if there is an alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, get up in the morning, um, uh, just basically sit at my desk and the first thing I do is, I mean, I've got one here right now. I've got a nice cup of black coffee. Um, it keeps me going for the day. And then I log on to my emails and I'll just go through what emails I've come through. So. It, it will be sometimes an artist might be interested in marketing. And then what we will do is we will schedule a phone call in. We'll have a consultation for about half an hour, an hour. We'll chat. We'll see what their expectations are. And then we will, um, and then if the artist is happy, then we will basically send contracts out and then we start working on their project. So I've got a team behind me who I delegate work to. So what happens is I'm the head of public relations. So I take care of all the PR side of things. And then I've got somebody else who actually does all the follow-ups and does the social media stuff. So all the work is delegated um, and is distributed evenly within my team. And then we just um, basically advise the client that we may need a press release. And the press release, we give the artist two options, how they want it. Do they want it as a, as a website format, so like a HTML, hyperlinked, or do you want it as a PDF? And then we just, and then we just basically start working on that going forward. You know, and then it, it does get quite busy. It does get very, very busy after that when we are marketing an artist. Um, but um, it's just about chasing up radio stations, scheduling interviews, chasing up TV channels, websites, music blogging sites, uh, scheduling social media posts. Um, we do a lot of offline marketing as well, you know, like radio blogging and stuff like that. Um, we do actually approach newspapers, magazines. So it's a lot of, lot of um, hard work and it is like a lot of hours does go into it. Um, and sometimes you pick a phone up and 
somebody might not answer, so you'd be chasing them and chasing them. But if you've got an artist who's doing international marketing, then what happens is you've got to take into account the time difference. So, for example, if somebody's getting marketed in America, it's an eight-hour time difference. Yeah. So you got to so you got to bear that in mind as well. So you can get very busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, I still imagine that it's um, it's better than working in radio because um, I, you know I saw the picture of you. We used it as the poster for the for the, the the trendy suit and all the rest of that. And I thought, wow, he looks good. And I thought, you know, if you work in the studio, you're constantly in in radio. You you don't really get to look good. And uh, people already tell me in the community that I've got a face for radio anyway. If that's a compliment or not, but it's just uh, <laughs> you, you got a you got a face for radio. <laughs> so it's just uh it's it, what i was thinking um yeah. earlier on today do you have the politics uh you know um in in, in terms of uh in 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 your industry and and how do you how do you you handle that way such as a certain presenter or certain station i said no no we we only like this PR company, or does that does that happen in reality? Or, um, to be honest, not really. Um, I wouldn't say so much so because I think radio stations. I feel that um, they should be supporting artists anyway, regardless. Because I think that um, it's about if we don't support an artist today, they could be the artist for tomorrow. So if we don't support them, how are they going to make their career? You know, how are they going to make that in the music industry? So we sell it to the art. We sell it to the radio stations that this is the artist of today. And basically, um, they could be the artists of tomorrow. Now, the established artists at the moment that are, in the, that are actually in the industry, they're going to at some point have to retire from music. And then the next generation that's going to come through will be the ones that are being marketed and supported by the radio stations. Um, I do get that some radio stations, um, um, they do have politics. And if they say, no, we can't market it at this stage, that's fine. Then we, will, we, we just carry on sending the music to them because at some point they are going to see something that they like. Um, but what we tend to do is we have good relationships with most radio stations anyway in the UK and abroad as well. So we constantly are trying to build our um, contact base, our mailing list. And we do from time to time have good conversations with them. And we are you know, keeping relationships because then tomorrow when we do get an artist for the product and it's a good product, we can then just do like a mass mailer and then do trace ups. And then it's our right thing from exclusive. But yeah, no problem. We play it, you know. Um, so it's that kind of uh, leverage that we have, but at the same time, we do schedule an interview like straight away. So if we've got them on the phone, an interview gets scheduled in as well at the same time. Superb, because what I was thinking earlier on, um, is there a line where you cross, uh, uh, you know, the, a defining boundary between being an artist, um, <laughs> PR, and also management, basically? So your PR, and then when yeah. do you become management? Is there... Is there, are there two separate worlds? Do they, do they merge? You know, well, the reason why I'm saying this to you is because um, I'll, I'll tell you something about the world of radio, especially Asian radio, right? Let's say <laughs> Gogar comes over from India, right? He's got a absolutely <laughs> banging like voice. Like <laughs> <Gogar. laughs> Or Kuka or Manga or something, right? Basically, they'll have amazing voices. <laughs> and um, what it is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the um, the uh, the manager or whatever he he'd basically book all the interviews so so um, you know Kuka would basically do a have a schedule or itinerary of basically going all over London first or whatever or you know Midlands first to all all the stations but what happens there is um, this is dirty a dirty tactic every station that Kuka goes to right at the end of the interview or to start you know they give him a shot. A, a, a shot of whiskey or brandy, whatever it is, right? And so the next presenter has got to deal with a slightly drunk version of Kuka, right? And and if you <laughs> <laughs> so so if you if you're last on that list, right, for the day, you're basically babysitting some drunk guy vomiting all over the studio, and and and, and like so, it it does your job entail this sort of um, managing the uh, the you know, the radio itinerary, the interview interview list? And ha go for it. Yeah, um, to be fair, it does. Um, so what we do is uh, we don't actually manage the artists, so to speak, from day to day. What we do is when we are setting up a marketing plan for the artist, we set up a interview schedule. 
And what we do is anything that's scheduled in, we then have, um, um, now this is where we're different. We don't have spreadsheets and stuff. We have a Google calendar. So what we do is, right, the artist has access to the Google calendar. So anything that's basically been, um, uh, that's been scheduled in, he can see, and then he knows his, uh, his, um, his schedule for the week. And what we do is we do send a representative from my team so a chaperone will go with the artist. Now, an artist should, in effect, have a management team anyway, because the, the whole job of a marketing agency is to promote the artist. And the, and the promotion side of it is getting them on radio, getting them in newspapers, magazines, getting them on TV, getting them interviews, getting them into newspapers with their press releases, right? So, so that's the job of a marketing agency. And plus, on top of that, helping them with their social media, getting them out online. So... The, the whole job of a, a management team is to basically organize gigs, organize um, the, any endorsement sponsorships, organize any. Um, so, for example, so let's say a, a clothing brand is coming to an artist, right? So that's an endorsement. So the management team will then arrange for the artist to wear those the, that high brand clothing in their music videos. Yeah. And that's how that works. So. That's not something that we've actually taken on, if, if I'm honest, because it's then a, like another job completely because managing an artist from day to day is a job in itself. So I think the marketing side of it, it does take up quite a lot of our time. But the management side, we do a lot. I mean, I've had a lot of artists say to me, Raj, can you manage me? And I'm like, do you know, unfortunately, that's not part of our services. You can't manage and do your marketing because then it's to a point, it's a conflict of interest a little bit. But at the same time, it's like we can do it. Uh, but I don't think we have the resources just now. Maybe in the future we might. So we might have like another branch, exclusive management maybe, I don't know. Uh, but we are looking and we are seeing how our business pans out in this next year or so. And if it does do very well, then we probably will look at basically doing artist management. But at the moment, as it stands, we don't do that. We leave that to the professionals and then we just take care of the marketing side. But that whole point of like sabotaging an artist we do send a representative, and if somebody is giving something, like, no, after the interview, when the whole when the whole schedule is done, yeah, that's fine. You could drink whatever you want, but not before the interviews. Mm -hmm. So we have we we do have a strict policy. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm I'm just telling you that story because it's the truth from literally my <laughs> early days of working in radio that that literally happened to to me. So we we, we, oh, we, we uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but basically they yep. were totally deadly man. So at, at the end of the day. <laughs> Which is which, which which isn't which isn't too good at all, right? It's not. It's, 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 it's not. It's not. But it's, it's not a very good. clever tactic, and I'm not going to name names. I'm, you know, li 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 live on this, or you know, what stations are involved in that. But it's just literally. It's, it was almost like they the, the, the stitched me up really. But then I learned the hard way about how the industry runs. Um, yeah. Okay. So tell us. An exciting or funny story about your life as a uh, as a music promoter. Music promoter. Um, exciting, I could say, is um, this is going back way back. Now. I'm I'm talking about when I was in my early twenties. Um, I was I, I, I basically played all, all over the UK. Yeah. Um, and we had an opportunity. There was a local team here you know, called Brisa Punjab, yeah. and they're like a Bangladesh dance team, but they're a dance group as well. So they had a gig in Germany, which got cancelled and they couldn't make it. So they said to me and one of my friends at the time, do you fancy going to Germany? So we were like, yeah, 100%, why not? And it turned out that it was all expenses paid and we got paid on top of it. Now, we had our flights paid for me and we went to Germany. We did a show in Stuttgart and the Punjabi community in Germany are amazing. They're so, so, so great, so friendly. And it was, it was a very exciting time because it was like, I've never experienced that level of exposure. You know, the guy came and picked us up in a nice Mercedes. He paid for our hotel, took us to his house for dinner. You know, so we were we were given like royalty treatment. Went to the gig. We did we did two slots. We had the bar in the house, so the guy gave us like a whole bar. He goes all drinks on, on us all night. You know, and he paid us on top of that. Back in those days, I think it was hundred euros we got, and it was quite a lot of money back then. Yeah. So got hundred euros on top, and we got um, our flights paid for so like there and back. So really, really enjoyed that. Um, but I think my personal experience, I think um, uh, me being as a producer, as a music producer as well myself, yeah. I think that was one of my highlights because I've always wanted to get into the music industry and to produce music. Um, I'm actually trained. I've done NVQ level one and two in music production. Yeah. So I've done the theory side of it. Um, Superb. So my debut single that came out in 2010 was my first track that came out. So, um, so that is my exciting 
part. But I'm hoping that this year I can launch my second single at some point. But we could talk about that. Later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Of, of course, we'll we'll come back to that and the impact of the uh, the COVID lockdowns on on launch. And I think you're not you're not the only person to be to be affected uh, yeah. uh, by launching their, their new tracks with with the whole lockdowns. And I actually feel myself that later on this year, you know, the, the, there may even be another lockdown. You know, um, it, it makes you think like it's it's scary. I mean, the fact that. Um, yep. Then again, what's scary for it for any industry? Like we're lucky that radiation, we literally run on a shoestring budget, and like literally, you know, for five years, we literally, you know, run. That's how we run. We don't have corporate sponsorship, as of as of yet, and even then, we're very very funny. That has to has to be ethical, um, yeah. as, as well. You know what I mean? Is it something that we a product that we um, or a company which provide a service that we have to believe in and, and like? Um, yeah. So. The lockdown for me, you know, personally working here in the studio all the time, it never really affected me in the sense that, um, in, in the sense that uh, financially or, or, or anything, and I'm so, I'm so used to doing, doing everything on, on a tight budget, providing our licensing is, in, is intact, that's the key thing. Mm. Um, and also, but we had a massive influx, influx of um, people producing new songs and how have you handled this influx of um cause has have you felt the influx of of uh, a whole bunch of people which were normally they could have been accountants working on you know L L london underground and suddenly making songs and sending it over to you for, <laughs> for pr so have you felt that influx as well over lockdown um i mean i can't say i have personally i mean the one change i did see though is that i did see a lot of artists and certain um, uh, people that I know and certain people that I don't know but I've seen their businesses, right? I've seen people that have got nothing to do with marketing and they've started to offer those services during lockdowns because I know that uh, on social media was a huge thing like in the last year because lockdowns and people were doing a lot of like TikTok videos, people were doing a lot of stuff on, uh, on Instagram, you know, on YouTube um, and Facebook. So I feel that I did see a massive influx on that side because um, although we were all, yeah, although like, we were actually stuck indoors so people were coming up with new ideas of how they can make a bit of extra cash so what they were doing was they were offering social media marketing services perhaps they have got knowledge behind it perhaps they know what they're doing but i did see a massive influx in that and i think that side of the market now has become a little bit overly saturated um but a, another trend that i did realize in the lockdowns where there was a lot of producers that were doing a lot of live um videos that were showing how they produce music so it's like behind the scenes. So they will have a camera and then they will show how to produce a track and it's like a five, six minute video. That is one thing that I realized and also realized a lot of live videos where like floor players were giving lessons online. Um, I saw a lot of that as well. A lot of, a lot of floor groups were doing that online lessons via Instagram Live, Facebook Live, YouTube Live. You know, so, that, so I did see a massive influx on that side. In terms of people producing music, sending it to us, I think what it have, what's happened is because of the incomes up there, I think it's yeah. it's kind of sabotage their ability to go to a studio and then produce a track and then release, do a video and then release it. So they haven't had the budget. So I think that's kind of dropped a bit. But I saw an influx in people doing stuff online. So that's the difference that I've seen in the, in the last year. Oh, wow. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, I think we've already touched up on the question where we basically say, asked um has anyone approached you with a track that you don't particularly like too much <laughs> and have, <laughs> do you knock them back to, or do you take the money <laughs> sort of thing get it um, <laughs> i mean <laughs> i like that question it's a very cheeky question eh? um <laughs> to be fair um we 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 do a lot of quality control okay and the way i look at it is that if i take a track that's not great it, it's gonna have a it's gonna have a ripple effect on my brand my brand exclusive PR. So we tend to do a lot of quality control. So although the money might be there, somebody might offer me a thousand pounds to do to do a track release, right? And I might look at it and I might think this track's not going to do well because although the money is there, the track's not going to do great. So I'm probably going to have to decline it and say go and work on it, and like basically improve it a little bit. This is where this is where you need to improve. Yeah. So I think the money is not always the be or end all. I think the product needs to be good first in order to yeah. uh, basically represent the brand of the artist and my brand because. If I take it and the track flops, the artist might go and start bad mouthing my brand, yeah. saying that's PR done a shit marketing job. But 
in a, in a matter of fact, your product wasn't great and the public didn't receive it well. So it's a, it's a catch-22, isn't it? It's like a rock in a hard place. So yeah. you have to sometimes just manage that expectation, as we spoke earlier. So we need to have that that consultancy that we do with the artists is really, really important. So we have that chat. We have a real chat about send us demos. Let's have a look at it. Let's see what you're all about. And if we feel that there is something there, but it needs to be a bit of tweaking, then we will advise the client, most definitely. But we don't just take the money in this and, and just release it. No, that's not our ethos, uh, our exclusive PR. 100% not. Wow. Good answer. Good answer. Well, <laughs> done. A very good answer. So, yeah, it's true. Uh, initially, the song should be half decent in the first place, if not more than half decent. Um, right. The world of Asian radio does comprise yep. of a few slippery characters, to say the least. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, You're going very close to today, Dad. <laughs> 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 it's all good, though. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> um, ha have you ever encountered some of these slippery ca characters? Not mentioned any names, but uh, uh, in, in promoting their, their their music and how how do you deal with them? Or what have you learnt from these experiences? Um, I wouldn't say I haven't. I wouldn't say I haven't because I think um, money is such a thing that everybody needs it, and everybody wants to make a quick buck on the side. Um, as you said, I'm not going to mention any radio stations, but we do experience it from time to time. And those presenters are the ones that we continue to send the music to, right? Because now imagine this, okay? We send a track to a particular presenter. So, so let's say presenter A. Presenter A says, I want X amount of money for me to play it. I say, okay, that's not a problem. Whoa. We, 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 we send it, but we're still not going to, but we're still not going to pay you. Okay. So we still send it. But then what happens is the BBC ends up supporting it and playing it. That presenter is going to look at that and think, okay, I need to play it because the BBC is playing it. You see, so that's where we kind of leverage it. You see, so we, the BBC are a, are a huge platform. They're a great platform. And I have yeah. got a few contracts in the BBC. Yeah. Um, and I've got some very, very good friends in the BBC. The Asian Network are a very good platform as well. Yeah. Um, and there are some very, very good presenters there. Yeah. And course, yeah. the thing is, we leverage the BBC for our artists, you see. Um, and what we say is that, um, if you're not going to support it, there will be other radio stations that will support it. We have a huge mailing list, you know, and then if one particular radio presenter is not going to support it at a particular radio station, so let's say radio presenter A is at radio station A, and they've got six presenters. Out of six, I reckon four, three or four might support it. Two might want money, you see? So, but out of those six, I might have a great relationship with four of them. So those are the four that I will send it to. Yeah. So yeah. That's, how we, that's how we leverage it. And some of these radio stations are awesome. They're absolutely brilliant in the work that they do, including yourself, Dave. You do a fantastic job. Well, um, thank some, you, of, sir. some of your interviews that you've done are <laughs> some of the interviews that, that you've done. Um, I've been watching on YouTube. They're great interviews, um, and I think the quality of the music that you put on is great. You know, and I've sent you music in the past, and you've always supported it. You know, and you're a great yes. presenter, and your station's great, and thank you'll grow. You. Thank you. You know. <laughs> that. It's amazing. Thank you so much for bringing me up. You know, I'll send you a bunch of phone later on for that. <laughs> <laughs> Not the background that you're talking about. <laughs> no, but do you know what what you've picked what you've picked up on, what you've highlighted, yeah, is that's yeah. um that is basically the elephant in the room in the world of radio and we traditionally it would have been called payola. But basically yeah. You know, we're talking about back in the days of was it the American Mafia and all the rest of that. You know, um, the, the Italians in America, uh, Sinatra, and you know the studio going approaching presenters, and you you better play this song and all the rest of that. So the, 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 there's a deep history behind it. Now, me personally as a presenter, I, I, I've never charged a penny. Yeah, I've 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 never charged a penny. I have heard of it happening in the in in the in the radio industry. I'm not going to mention any names as a presenter, <coughs> and um, I, um, you know, but the problem is is whether management take the money from the artist or or, or the or or their management, mm. and then they force a song upon presenters, and so you could mm. be presenting a show. Now, as a presenter talking, you may have to play out a song, and I've been in the situation where you know it's going to kill your mood. Yeah, and and then after that, everyone goes. What happened? You know what I mean? 
so you know tadi pakri maar ke or something at the end of the day which is <laughs> <laughs> which is it's, it's, <laughs> and uh, but it's because you you had you had to do that and that's one reason why I'm glad I'm, I'm independent now all, all I've done I set up a a Patreon account to help support the station now um whether artists want to give to that it doesn't make a difference if their the songs banging it's banging and it's getting played i i i don't care because i i know that i finance everything myself anyway by working shifts that's that's my life um but yeah. that is actually how how it works uh, you know it shouldn't work that way but literally it is where presenters are being paid off you know <laughs> i think what it is dub i think it's the, the Asian music industry aside, I think every music industry is the same. I think we think the Asian music industry is cut for it. The Western market is even worse, you know, because some of the biggest radio stations like Kiss, Capital, you know, it's very hard to get on those. It's not easy. Um, but we have a mailing list, which we can basically send straight to their playlist managers and certain presenters, right? And if they pick it up and they like it, they might end up playing it, you know? Um I mean, I'll just give you an example. It's like when I first came on the scene as an artist in 2010, I sent my press release to the whole of the UK. At that time, I was working for another marketing agency as a freelancer, and my role was um, as an account manager. So, as part of the deal, they offered me a percentage in the PR company. So, what happened was I was working with them, but I was marketing my own track, and I sent it out. And then, an email came in, and the director of the company goes, "Raj," he goes. There's a there's a BBC presenter who wants to put your track onto an album in India on Universal Music. He was creating a compilation album. So what happened was he goes to me that what do you want to do? I said, look, I goes if they, if, if 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 Universal Music want my track, ask him to pay me what 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 I, what I paid for my project. And they go, it's probably not going to happen, but we can ask. So they came back and they go, look. We're not going to pay you, but what we'll give you is you'll get international acclaim and you get a lot of exposure because it's um, universal music. You see, so so this is what I'm saying right here. I that was a new true. artist. I was a new artist, but the fact of the matter is, if your music's good and if some there might be one presenter that likes it, they will support it fully. You see, unfortunately, that deal didn't happen because there was some there was some um, some negotiations between the presenter and um, Universal Music India that didn't happen. So the negotiations fell through, and what happened was my project didn't end up going with a compilation album. But there were other big names on there, huge names, and I was going to be like associated with that, right? So that would have taken me to another level as a producer, yeah. But that fell through. But then I never dropped my head because I then found out my track was being played in Las Vegas in a club every week, every Friday. So there was a resident DJ, and he he messaged me on my on my YouTube channel, and he goes, "I'm playing your track every Friday." He goes, "It's a banging track." And then I heard it was getting played in India. So I was like, okay, I'm getting, there was something happening here. I don't know what's happening. You know, so sometimes I think artists just need to take it step by step, baby steps, right? Um, when you're a new artist, right, unfortunately, radio stations don't take you seriously because they think you might be a one hit wonder. They only see consistency. So if you look at the likes of Shinda, Jazzy B, I'm in here and them, they've been around in the game a very long time, probably 20 plus years, right? So, Radio stations want to see consistency, and any time we approach a radio station, we we ask the artists, "How many tracks do you have? Do you have a bank of tracks? If they've got six tracks, we like to listen to them, and then we go to the radio station and say, "No, this artist can do six releases, right? So he's got six tracks. You see, can you please support it? He's got consistency. He'll be releasing every three months. So that's how we leverage that. We don't we don't like it when there's politics in the music industry, but unfortunately, in any industry, there's politics. You can't get away." Um, and it's just about managing it. It's just about managing expectation. That's what it comes down to. I think um, for me, like, as I'm just a small fry presenter, I'm an independent basically. But for me, <laughs> it, I am. But uh, but the thing is, I just look at has the artist put effort into the song. It doesn't have to be 100 yeah. perfect. Yeah, as long as they put effort there, and you and our, our ears can can hear the effort. You know, there could be a few things wrong here and there. The, 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 we, we give them a, a hand. For, to be honest, I'm I'm actually still, I'm not shocked by uh, what you said regarding the um, you've actually encountered the people you know pay where you pay the presenter, you pay the to pay to play payola. I'm just thinking about that in the back of my head. Right now, what are the 
perks of the job? I mean, obviously you must get exclusive songs before anyone else has got them. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. So, I would say for me personally, right, the, the perks of the job are seeing an artist flourish. Okay. You see, so if you see an artist go from here to here, and you've done the marketing for that, and it's and it's, and the trajectories like that of, of, of an artist. That for me is really, really good self fulfillment because I know, okay, the artist's budget wasn't great. He came to me with whatever he had, but his trajectory is going up like that, you know? And especially with independent new artists, because I think with them, they don't have a platform to release music, you know? And that's why I launched my own record label as well called Audio Replay. Yeah. So that's mainly for independent artists because I don't want any established artists on there because established artists don't need to a point they don't need my record label and to a point they don't even need my services because they've got a, a name in the industry yeah they've got people on the phone and they'll get an interview tomorrow that's not a problem for them I think it's more for independent new artists you know the ones that are coming into the industry the new generation I want to help them but the thing is what I would say is that be a bit more how can I say, be a bit realistic about your budgets in order for you to be successful. So for me, the I mean, I love it when I see someone succeed. That's my fulfillment. And and with me, I think going forward, I'm really, really passionate about music. Whether my music succeeds or not, that, that, that's another story. But I want to see another artist that comes to me. I won't just treat him as a client. I will treat him as a good friend as well. And we try to have a good relationship. And then if you've got a good relationship, you're not then fighting against each other. You're working together as a team. And that's what it should be. It should be teamwork. And if you're working as a team, you'll flourish. If you're working against each other, nine times out of ten, right, it, it doesn't work. That relationship will just will just diminish. So for me, um, going back to your answer, is that um, um, it's to see someone succeed and see someone be successful in the music industry and having a great music career. But you also get obviously merchandise and get invited to gigs and all the rest of that, of course. Yeah, before lockdown, um, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we do, <laughs> um, we do get invited, but obviously, I, like uh, like down to our schedules and that, uh, we tend to just basically see what's more priority. So, let's say if I've got any, like an invitation to an award ceremony, but I've got an artist who I've got to take to an interview, for me that would be more important. You see, but then I can send a representative of my team to the award ceremony. So we do get a lot of invites. We do get invites to gigs. We do get like, we do get a lot of exclusive music, which I love listening to. And some of it's great. It's really, really good music, but it's not getting out there enough, you know, because um, the artists are not getting exposure, unfortunately. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I think you've answered many questions in in, in one regarding uh, with that <laughs> answer there, which, which is good. So the elephant in the room, in the world of radio, right, uh, if we have paid likes, followers and subscribers um, and all the rest of that all paid for, we'll soon get found out, our pants will get pulled down because as soon as somebody wants to advertise with us uh, yes. you know, there's, there's hardly going to be any uh, difference in sales um, yeah. for that company or the, or, the, or, the, or the product whatever they're trying to shift um, obviously so it, won't, it won't be reflected in the, in the sales volume Um so what are your views on artists using click farms to up the illusion of fame, you know, fake it till you make it and all the rest of that? Absolutely. I think that is, in my opinion, as a marketing agency, I think that's wrong because, okay, now let me give you a scenario. Um, your track comes out, the marketing behind it's fantastic. Okay. Your track's gone, it's sitting in the top 10 in the charts, let's say. BBC are playing it and he's getting a lot of exposure, right? you then have been called to a gig as a headline act, okay? You've got over 1 million views on, a, 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 let's say, YouTube. Your social media have got loads of followers. But the the promoter says, if you bring X amount of followers, you will get X amount of money. Because mm. the way this work is that if you're a headline act, you've got to bring in X amount of followers for them. And then the, the door money gets split between the artist, the, the promoter themselves, and the, and the bar. Because the bar used to be basically making money as well. So the, so, like the way the, so the way the gig industry works is the artist will get some money, but then they have to bring a level of their fan base into the, into the, into the gig. Yeah. Now, if you're saying you've got 1 million subscribers, and let's say you've got 100,000 followers on your social media, and no one turns up, you've been found out. <laughs> So the promoter will be like, where's your followers? So we say, do not 
do that, especially as a new artist, because I think as tempting as it might be, okay, the the online um, presence it's going to give you, right, is all great. But yeah. when, it, when it comes down to the crunch, when it comes down to you getting your supporters to come and support you at a gig and no one turns up, you're going to get found out. Okay, wow. and I think I don't know if you remember. I think it was a, a number of years ago. Um, I think Panorama did a documentary that there was a kick factory in Dhaka, right, where um, um, where people were going and had a hidden camera where a where the presenter went in and he was shocked to see that people were actually buying this from all over the world, especially in Europe. And UK was one of the prominent places where the prime business was coming from because it was businesses and artists right, that were buying fake views for YouTube just to be successful in life. And I think as, as soon as that documentary came out, I think a lot of artists put back on it because they got found out. Now, yeah. you might have a track that comes out today. Tomorrow morning, you will see that it's got 1 million views. How is that possible? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Because some of the biggest artists that are in the industry right now, I mean, even someone like Sikshinda Shinda, he does not get the level of views that some artists get, the new ones. But someone like Diljit Dasanj, who's a, who's a global superstar, mm. I can understand that with him. Dr. Zeus is another one. Mm. You know, so there are so many other big names, like you've got the Billa, you've got Ami Burke, you've got Gurnan Buller, all these ones, they've made their name and they've got to a level where they now have those natural views. Whereas if you're a new artist doing that, you're going to get found out. So I would strongly advise against it. Don't do that. As tempting as it might be. Oh, wow. Grow organically. Grow organically is better for you. And if you grow an organic, an organic fan base, they will follow you like wherever you go. That is so That's true. Like, I mean, you, you can use it as a gauge of your success if you do it organically as well. I'd imagine like, uh, because where you do something wrong, you, they may drop down slightly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, yeah. Or, or, or significantly. But um for me, like I, obviously, if you if, if you got a brilliant song and you're you're a brilliant artist, and you, you, then you know you can have that hit track, and therefore it could have the million views overnight from, from even from, from from a new artist, it could be like a, a viral uh, sort of thing. But I mean, I'll yeah. give you know, I'll give you an example, Dan. I mean, I don't know if you remember when Sherry Mind first came on the scene. He released a track called Yard of the Molly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Of course, yeah. So the story behind that, right, is that. When he did that track, he put all his money into that track, okay? And he went to some of the biggest record labels. He went to, I think it was um, Speed Records in India. He went to Planet in the Canada, and he came to the UK, and he went to Movie Box, okay? All these record labels rejected him. They said, no, it's not a good enough track here. We don't want it. So what he did, he thought, okay, for a laugh, right? He goes, I'm going to put it online. So he put it on YouTube, and overnight oh, success. His track grew so fast because he had this organic growth and that's how Sherry Mann was born. Because that Yara the Mullah song was so big that his team behind him that supported him, that was there from day one, they got him to where he is today. And the same story goes for Honey Singh, because Honey Singh actually studied in, um, he studied in America, and he studied in Oxford in, in, in the UK, I think he was. He studied uh, music engineering. He did the same thing. He, he approached a lot of record labels. Nobody liked him. Nobody thought his music was great. He went away to India, and then he released that... Um, uh, and that track exploded and that's when movie box came running for him when he did Lux 28 so it's like sometimes don't chase it let it come to you if your music's good it will come to you don't chase it wow that's what we see another example I can give is Darshan uh, Lakhevala that that song then uh, valence of I think that song is so excellent that the way he just sang it uh, tapping yeah. on, on the the wall or whatever you know what I mean that yeah was just, it's just raw talent isn't it it's, yeah it's, it's, it is I mean if you look at okay so look, we were speaking earlier about artists okay um, the artists how they suffered during lockdown now there's one artist that I loved during lockdown and he's become one of my ultimate favorites he was my favorite anyway. But I called him the TikTok king. So that artist's name was um, Ami Vuk. Yeah. Now, what he was doing was he was doing short 30, 40 second videos. And he was doing cover versions of tracks that were basically out already. He was doing cover versions and putting them out on, on uh, Instagram or TikTok. And he became, a, he became such a sensation on TikTok. It grew and exploded. But one thing I will say to artists as well, right? Don't rely so much on social media because... Social media is here today, it could be gone tomorrow. Okay. My advice would be, 
and this is a free tip for today, is that set up a good, engaging website because your website will be there forever on Google and you want to rank on Google. Social media is here today. It could be gone tomorrow. And TikTok got banned in India. Therefore, um, Ami Verk had to switch his strategy to Instagram Reels and going on other platforms. You see, so it's um, social media is like this. It's good for online presence, but it's not be or angle. You see, your product and I think a very good website and having a strategy with that is brilliant, I would say. Also, That's my advice. Anyway, I also say uh, being a great live performer. Hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. Learn your art. Learn your art is what I say. Of course, of course, of course. So, um, let's say like for, for, you know, I've, I've already said like there's a story that you gave as an example. Where basically, you had clients which have had like no uh, followers on Instagram or whatever, and within yeah. like a day or two, or was it a week? They got up to seven hundred with your tips, your free tips. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so basically during the first lockdown, what happened was, um, surprisingly, I made some very good friends during lockdown. And um, there was this one girl, she she basically was recommended to me. Now, this is amazing. You've got to go and check this guy out, right? His name is, oh, God, I've forgotten his name, right? He's he's a black guy, but he plays the door. Oh, and he's wow. absolutely phenomenal. Br re right? Brilliant, yeah. Yes, he's absolutely brilliant. And basically, right, um, the thing with him, he actually recommended me to this girl. Now, she was setting up a perfume company, okay? So what happened was we had a consultation, 30-minute chat, and she said to me, Raj, I'll be recommended. What do I need to do? So she, I just gave her basic advice on what she needs to do, what she doesn't need to do, and look at this, look at that, sort your hashtags out, optimize your, your, um, your profile, monetize your profile, have engaging content, you know, post at certain times, looking at your data, your stats on Instagram. And her profile grew from zero to 700. And she's doing very well now. She set up a, I advised her how to set up an Instagram shop. She went and set up an Instagram shop and now she's selling directly from Instagram. And she's selling her perfumes on Instagram and Facebook. Wow, that, 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 is, a, that, that is a success story. I think at Radiation, I think we have like 420 followers and then and that is about it but 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 the flip side of it is no we're not artists we are a radio station and the thing is if you look at who our followers are our yeah. followers are actually artists themselves but the, the vast majority so, uh, of them are. i'll give you some free tips afterwards <laughs> oh, thank you that, that, but 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 what we'll do we'll um like i said as as i just mainly artists themselves but yeah thank you i'll definitely take the advice it's only a full wouldn't take the advice from a specialist. You know what I mean? <laughs> At least take it on, on, on board. Um, right. Okay, so I'd imagine that st uh, strategic alliances and good relationships uh, with media companies are vital uh, for the success of exclusive PR. So what hurdles um, and notable successes have you had uh, regarding uh, you know relationships and you getting ahead or being held back? Um. I think the success is that um, um, that we've got a lot of brand exposure out there now, I would like to think. Um, that um, I've just recently, I don't want to say too much, but recently I got approached for something that's going to be hopefully be announced in the next three to four months. Um, and if this thing actually gets, um, if I actually, how can I say, if I actually win this, it will basically take my company to another level, okay? So I'm not gonna find out anything yet. I got approached uh, last about last week, and what happened was this company, they said to me, that would you like to apply for this? I said, okay, so I applied for it. And, and I just asked them, I go, how did you find me? They go, we, we found you on Google. So they said to me that you're certainly doing something right. They go, if, if we found your email and we found you on Google, you are seriously doing something right. So that for me is a success story in itself, because I'm always active on social media. Um, I would say I've worked with some great businesses. I've advised some great artists and businesses. Um, in um, I think it was 2000 and was it 2015, 16 when the Jashab Zadi film came out, the Punjabi uh, Sikh movie. I actually did the marketing for that. We did the London marketing, and I was very pleased to say that it did very, very well. Um, and that was released by um, Durham Seva Records. 
Um, and it, it did very well globally. Um, the setback for me, though, are that businesses in this last year um, don't have any budgets, unfortunately, um, due to COVID. So it's killed a lot of businesses and it's kind of affected my my income as well in terms of like what I can offer artists now. So uh, artists and businesses, sorry. So the thing is that we offer many great services, but the problem here is that some of those services are very expensive and businesses that are approaching us don't have those budgets. So what we've done is we've designed an affordable social media marketing and content creation packages. So they're very, very affordable packages. And these packages are available now today. So if anybody's interested, like they can actually get in touch and we can give like a 30 minute consultation for free. Um, our consultation normally costs quite a lot of money. You could say up to about 250 pound an hour, more than, more than likely. But we're doing free consultations because we understand that businesses are really struggling. They're just about uh, getting back and out into the market because it's the lockdown's easing now. And the social media packages, I would say, are, are affordable. So do get in touch and uh, let's see how we can help you. Um, but in terms of but in terms of moving forward, we have got a lot of stuff that's going to be happening in the next three to six months. Um, and keep an eye out on our YouTube channel. We're going to be doing a lot of video marketing tips. So we're going to be doing a lot of um, uh, videos with marketing tips, trends, stats, do's and don'ts. Um, that's going to be for free for all businesses. So that's going to be on YouTube, IGTV, and on um, our Facebook. Um, on on the Instagram uh, TV and on Facebook, and we're going to be giving away some free products as well. And we're doing actually, and we're doing a competition on Instagram. So the minute we reach two thousand followers, we're going to be launching a competition, and that competition is going to be um, there's going to have instructions on it, and then we're going to announce a winner live on IG on uh, on Instagram live, and that will be a free website. So anyone that needs a free website, they can come to us, and then we will basically. Um, um, we will then create one for them. But that will be, once we hit 2,000 followers, we're going to do a competition. Wow. Well, that, that's brilliant. What I wanted to get back to, uh, we touched yeah. on it at the start of the interview, was how have you, because you've been assisting uh, businesses uh, during lockdown. Um, yeah. You know, Can we talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, during the last year, and I'm still doing it now, to be fair, um, it's, it's primarily on Instagram and some bits on Facebook. What I tend to do is um, I'm in a lot of like networking groups on Facebook. So whatever tips I find, I grab them and I post them into these groups. And, and the idea is to help businesses that are in those groups. Yeah. So it could be a video. It could be a article to read. So you just go in there. My Facebook page and my Instagram page has got loads of free tips. OK, so that is one side of it. So we've got loads of free tips. You don't have to pay for any of these tips. They're all researched. And then we just post them onto Instagram and Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and so forth. Um, and what we also do is our Instagram primarily because it's it's different to Facebook. It's that it's got highlights. So in the highlights, we do a lot of shout outs. So, for example, we do weekend shout outs. So tomorrow is going to be another day where we pick new followers. And what we do is we give them a shout out and it, and we post that to our story and that gets posted into our highlights. Now, the idea of that is that my highlights gets over 100 plus views a day. So anyone that sees that, they will probably follow that person. If they like the product, they will then buy it. That's the idea. And I'll do that for free. But what I also do is I also do a business shout out. So I create this like post and then it goes into business shout outs as well. Also all business support. So I've been doing that for a lot of businesses and I have found that some businesses um, followers have increased and some have actually um, gained business, actually for financial business from that little bit of support that I've provided. And what I also do is every Sunday we do a business quiz on Instagram and the idea for that is to educate my followers. So if you've got a business and you don't understand certain elements, it's a quiz, it's a multiple choice question. You pick which question you think is right and whichever one's wrong, you could then say, oh, okay, I, I didn't even really know that. So I learned something new today. So it's a knowledge-based fun quiz that we do. One quiz a weekend, so it's every Sunday. Where, where did that come from? That's a brilliant idea. Um, I was, um, the thing is, I've got a very good team, as I said, behind me. So I've got a guy in my team um, who's a, he advises me. He's a business coach. Um, and that's one of the services that we actually offer. We offer one-to-one -one business coaching services as well. So he's a business coach and he creates some of my, he's created a lot of video content for me that I'm going to be doing in the future. 
Um, and he advised me, he said, look, he goes, how can you level up? And I said, look, I've got an idea for a quiz, right? I goes, but I don't know how to, I don't know the questions. So he goes, leave that to me. So he does all the research and I do the implementation. You see, so my team does the research and I put the questions out. Now, a lot of these questions are down to businesses that actually need. So what I'm doing is there's a problem. I'm providing a solution, but I'm providing it in a clever, fun way. I'm not being boring and pragmatic. What I'm doing is I'm basically providing it in a way where people can um, engage. So in Instagram, there are so many tools that people don't use enough. I mean, there's something I'm going to be doing very soon called guides, and there's going to be a lot of free Instagram tips on there. So all of my posts that are to do with Instagram is going to be in the guide section, and you can just go through it and look at all the tips in there. So there's a lot more coming from exclusive PR. So we're going to be doing a lot more free content that's going to help a lot of businesses. Hopefully somebody will book us and buy some of our services. But the idea is to help as many businesses as we can during this during this tough time. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So um, not to mention any names or anything, right? But <laughs> have you ever encountered like arrogant sort of media personalities? And is there an element of schmoozing and to win favor with these types or do you just keep it real and just don't dance to the to the tune sort of thing? Um, media personalities, I think what we got to understand is the really famous ones have social media teams that actually manage their, um, that actually manage their social media platforms. So what happens is they probably get hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of people that are messaging every day. And it's in, not impossible to actually go through every single message. So the answer to that would be, uh, uh, I mean, if I was, it would be unfair to, for me to say yes, because the social media companies that are dealing with these, these celebrities' accounts probably can't go through all the messages. So I would say, no, I haven't. Um, every celebrity that I have actually spoken to has been supportive. I mean, I've got this live Instagram chat that's going to be happening very soon. And it's with a singer called Sophie or Sophia. She's actually on, on Instagram and she's, absolutely amazing she's a fantastic singer and send over the song then dude sorry send over the song <laughs> i will do i will do what i will do is i will send you over her her um, instagram link and i'll send you the video of one of the songs that i love it's one of my favorite songs of her her vocals give me the chills my hair stands up on the back of my neck wow. she's got the most amazing voice right so we can have a chat now um, in the next week or so on Instagram Live. And it's going to be about music and mental health and how it's affected artists, you know? So um, she's very, very nice. She, she's a blue tick artist, very successful. She's a number one billboard artist, you know, and she's not arrogant at all. So every time I message her, she always takes time out and she replies back, always, you know? So I can't say that she's arrogant at all. She's a, she's, she is an example to, she sets an example basically for all the other artists, I would say. But having said that, some of them have social media companies that actually manage their accounts. So they probably haven't got time to apply to everyone. Some artists manage it themselves, you see. Um, so no, I mean, I think, I, I just think you've got to balance it and see um, who you're talking to. Brilliant, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Sophia's, um, Sophia's work. I think I've been fiddling around with this, with this wire in, in the studio and, and what it's done, it's made something go funny over here with the, Ah, there we are. We've got, got it quiet again. Now, have you have, have you ever come across this? Oh, come on, Bajiara. Come on, man. You know what I mean? Basically, Punjabis would like to haggle, right? You know what I mean? So, um, do you offer a service for independent artists on a tight, tight budget? Um, When you say tight budget... um. It, it, it just depends how tight that budget is, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Will 500 quid do anything? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so so let's say, um, I think every industry, whether it's my industry or whether it's, let's say, let's go into the hospitality industry now, okay? You're gonna look for a deal to go to a restaurant to have a nice food, have nice drinks, okay? So you're gonna look for a deal. I think when you're going to look to go on holiday, you do the same thing. You look for a deal. And I think that being in my, in the music industry, it's not different. I think everybody wants a deal, you know? Everybody wants to negotiate. So I think negotiation is part and parcel of um, business. 
But I think that if somebody came to me with a really unrealistic budget, I just happen to decline it. Because the way I do my marketing is that my marketing is based on an eight-week campaign, which is two months. Certain PR companies will charge you up to about £1,500 a month. That's £3,000, just a layout on your marketing. Okay, I tend to make it affordable for my clients. So I don't charge monthly. Right? I charge a one-off fee based on eight-week campaign. Okay, so if you divide that by the hours, the months, the weeks, yeah, that I'm going to be working, it works out to be sometimes under national minimum wage. Okay, so I'm thinking about the artist here. So I do tend to give them a good deal. But when you say, so for example, if I said to you, Dav, um, £1,500 is going to cost you for eight weeks, right? Yeah. But if you divide that by the weeks and the days and then the hours, it works out to be just under national minimum wage. You see, now, national minimum wage, I think it's about £9.20. Welcome to the world of radio, my end, man. That is it. See? So, yeah. I mean, but what we tend to do is, I mean, if, I mean I'm mean, i not going to name any names, but I have had one or two artists that have come to me that are quite established, that have had a ridiculous budget, and they'll be willing to pay me pittance. Okay? And I had one huge superstar artist that I could have worked with but back in 2017, I think it was, 2016, 17. Hmm. But I declined it because the, the deal was not appropriate. You see, the deal wasn't right for me because they don't want me to work for free and I couldn't associate my brand with the artist. So they so then I, so they basically wanted, they wanted to have the cake and have a cherry, like a, have a cherry on top. So I said, no, thank you. I said, basically, and, uh, as good as it's going to be for my business, I'm not going to get any business out of it. You see, and the line that gets always thrown out is that, oh, you will be in a network of artists. There will be other artists that will be interested in your business. As the saying goes, you've done it once, you won't do it again. <laughs> so, I've done that once for somebody and I didn't get no business out of it. So I'm not doing that again, unfortunately. I know my worth um, and I know what my worth is. So if you want to employ me to do your marketing, I will do 110%. I've got above and beyond. Mm. But I won't do anything for free, unfortunately. That is deep. I'm, I'm doing it enough as it is for free. So. Do you know what it is? Not it's it's, a, it's about knowing your your worth, and I think what you've just touched on is very that that, that it literally is very deep. So I've literally been working for like five years, you know, doing radiation. Um, yeah, and, and it's it's like, but then again, I do I do it for for the love of it, and I, and, I, and I also know that my brain is within uh, finance and stocks and all the rest of that. And um, yeah, but, but but what it is is um knowing your worth and where because what yeah. it is once people devalue you once you know what i mean and that, that's that's that really hits my heart actually because um because if you know your worth and you, you 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 stick to it um you'll save um yourself from a lot of bad experiences yeah um you know feeling devalued and, and the rest of that like I'm, I'm i'm happy doing what i do but the hours are extremely extremely long like i'm worn out uh all the yeah. time but it's good to helping people uh, along the way, and um, wow! Well, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was going to say that. I was going to say that. Although you put the long hours in, um, I think sometimes what it is you have to put the shift in now to see the fruits of the labor later. Because the idea is that you're putting all your hard grafting now to get your brand out there. Yes. Once your brand is known, and people say, "Hang on a minute, who is really Asian?" I want to go and approach that. You might even start getting sponsorships. You, know? you might even start getting people that want to pay money, right, to basically advertise on your website. You might start, you know, there's so many different avenues of income that you can start generating. I think what you're doing is correct. You're actually putting the grafting now yeah. to get the fruits of the labor later. And I think with any business, uh, whether it's entertainment or whether it's corporate, you have to put the level of effort in. You have to put the graft in for your business to, to succeed later. I mean, exclusive PR have been running since 2014. I think I've come a long way. Yeah. We've still got a lot of hard work to do because I want to automate my business. The idea is, this is my strap line and this is my ethos. I don't want to work in my business. I want to work on my business. Wow. The idea is, the idea is that if you're working in your business, you lose focus on where your business should be, where you want to take your business. Yeah. So as a director, I will be going against the green because I will be like, I'm working in my business, but I want to work on my business. So the idea is I've got a team that I delegate, that I delegate the work to, right? But I'm automating a lot of my business. So I'm basically working smart, not hard. You see? 
now I'm hoping within the next five years or so, I will see the fruits of the labour. That's the idea of it. And I think there are certain things happening this year that I'm hoping that those things that come together like a jigsaw will make that happen in 2022. Because 20, 2020, 2021 has been a, bit a difficult year for everybody because of COVID, you know? So the minute we come out of lockdown, I'm hoping that all that will ease and will make things a lot easier for businesses and artists alike, you know? So... Aha, right, this, this is going to be like a random curveball. Are you ready for it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> is it true, right, that your patake set fire to the next door neighbor's trampoline? <laughs> um, no, it didn't. What happened? What happened was <laughs> what happened was we it, it was on Diwali, okay? It was on Bundy Shore and on Diwali, okay? And we actually we were lighting fireworks, but don't forget there were fireworks being lit all over. In the area, because where I live now, there's a lot of Asians that have moved here. Yeah. So what happened was there must have been a misfiring rocket that went into our neighbor's garden. Yeah. And it actually burst their uh, jumping castle, I think it was or something. It burst something of theirs. But <laughs> 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 the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um... It, it, it is okay so is there anything else that, that I, sh I, sh I should ask you um i always ask this to everyone so I, I don't want you to say you know he's a crap presenter he didn't bother asking me this and that so you know is, is there anything that you want to get across or get off your chest and besides about burning down people's trampolines <laughs> <laughs> people don't believe that right that trampoline story i don't know where that's come from <laughs> But um, what I would say is, um, do, do, like, the only thing, I mean, I haven't got any burning desire, of, like, a, a, anything burning to get off my chest. But the only thing I will say is that um, I wish all the businesses a lot of success this year. You know, um, I know we're coming out of lockdown now. Just be, just take it easy and just uh, adhere to social distancing guidelines and just do what you need to do to be safe. Because obviously this COVID hasn't gone yet. Um, obviously, obviously, there is this rise of the Indian variant. So we just got to be careful. We just got to be sensible. We got to be clever, you know, because we don't want businesses closing again and we don't want the economy to go for another decline. Mm. What we want, we want our country to go to get back to where it was two years ago. We want the uh, economy to pick up so everybody can have a successful career, um, say a successful business, you know, especially small to medium sized businesses, you know, because they're the ones that are funding everything themselves and they're folding. So, and if anybody wants any help and need any advice, you got to come and find us. Um, you can check us out on um, Instagram, uh, Exclusive PR UK. Check us out at um, Facebook, Exclusive PR. You can check me out on uh, LinkedIn at Raj Singh. You know, and just hit me up. Give me a call. Uh, drop me an email at info at exclusivepr.com. And if you have any questions, you want any advice, guidance, give me a shout. I'd be glad to help. Brilliant. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And, and uh, thank you for phoning in. Uh, Raj from Exclusive PR. Thank you so much, Dav. It's Mr. been a pleasure to be on. Cool, mate. God bless you. God bless you too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.